Praise the Lord. As I praise the Lord. Can you still take another message? You know sometimes when you come to a congress like this, and you see, these preachers will never stop talking. You know, the first time we came, and then morning, and this, and this, and that. And now we're almost totally stopped, and now he comes again. You like that voice? Say yes. Let's stand up then if you like the voice. We're going to do something again. Why don't you go to the Word of God? And the Word of God will benefit us and prosper us in Jesus' name. And you say, tiredness, get away from me. <laughs> say it very well. You know, I really appreciate you. I love you, Aunt. I just put myself in your position and asked myself, what if I were the one sitting down there and then morning and afternoon and evening and all these preachers come, they fire me and then they say, rise up. And my leg is already taking me, they say, rise up again. And then he comes here and he says, now everybody stand up. I say, why don't you let me sit down for some time? I wish, you know, I was as strong as you are. And, uh, you know, you are very, very strong. Praise the Lord. I told you, now I gave you my strength, and I said I pass it on. Didn't you have it? Yes. And very soon I'll give you the microphone too. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes. Just the joy of the Lord, that is our strength. Let's try, so let's, or see me now. Well, well I stand up already, and I said, let's rise up again. Well, maybe we should rise up again. Yes. Higher and higher in Jesus' name. Yes. Let's close our eyes to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your people. How we appreciate this congregation and our congregation there, the DLCC. In fact, the DLCC congregation, they have been wonderful. They didn't grudge me or be unhappy with me. And when I say stand up here, then they stand up and say, why didn't you come here? Lord, we just pray. Your blessing you are pouring out upon us at the IBTC, multiplied blessing. Pour upon them at the DLCC in Jesus' name. Lord, we are not tired. We will never be tired. As you move on in the strength of the Lord, we'll be stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. Whatever it takes or wants to do with this single life we have, Lord, we pray you will do it. Nothing will restrict you in our lives in Jesus' name. We will work. We will preach. We will minister. We'll plant churches and we're going to do everything you have called us to do, appointed us to do, and we're going to succeed in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, as we come to this message on church planting, saturation, church planting, and church growth, oh Lord, there will be no useless member of your church, no useless minister of your church. Everyone here, brother and sister, will be used to the maximum level in Jesus' name. Lord, as you reward me, you reward all your children here. And Lord, as you prosper the work in my hand, you'll prosper the work in their hands in Jesus' name. We're going to have the same victory, the same success, and the same progress, and the same anointing, Lord, you grant unto us. We're going to be useful to the maximum level in Jesus' name. Equip us once again. Envelope us once again. Protect us once again. That will match on. We're going to succeed in this work together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. I just love your 
uh, your kind of uh, heart and your attitude, and this work is going to succeed. We're looking at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye to all the world, and preach the gospel unto every creature. As you look at this, it's almost like it's an impossible task. How can this be done? Go ye to all the world, no exception. Every nation, every country, every community, every village, every town, every city, anywhere you find people gathering together, anywhere there is life, go ye into all the world. How can we do that? Well, even now, it's much better than then. Because now there are aeroplanes, there are ships, there are bicycles, there are motor cars, there are various means of transportation now. Now there is radio, now there is television, now there is internet, now there are possibilities they didn't have at that time. And yet, without the possibilities we have, which they did not have, he tells us, he told them, go ye to all the world. And then the other part is, and preach the gospel to what kind of people? Every creature, the men and the women, the high and the low, the educated and the illiterate. He said, of every language, of every province, of every tribe, it says, go preach the gospel to every creature. And then we're asking ourselves, can that really be done? Will that really be done? Well, let's look at the end result. We're looking at Revelation chapter 7. Right now, as we look at Revelation chapter 7, we're coming to the time when the people, they are now in heaven, because the church has obeyed the Great Commission. I will obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we have gone to every location, every city, every village, every town, every community, every tribe, all places we have gone, I will preach the gospel to every creature. And the people have responded. See the results in chapter 7 of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. If, if, even if you stopped there, when it says, I'm looking at heaven now, I'm looking at the result of the church walking and ministering and preaching the gospel to every creature. And lo, as we get to the other side, you know, the first side is over here, or just about 12, then about 70, then about 120, then about 3,000, then about 5,000, then multitudes of people. But now we come to the far edge. After we've gone all the preaching, we've done all the counseling, we've done all the praying, we've done all the evangelism, and we come to the end of the day, and the end of the age, and the end of the assignment the Lord has, has given us. He now says, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. That means we're talking of something more than a million. We can number a million, a hundred million, we can number that. A billion, we can number that. Trillions, we can number that. But this one now, which no man could number of all nations, praise the Lord, it will be done. I said it will be done. And you, you know, sometimes when something is being done, or is to be done, and then somebody is pulling back, I will say, come. Whether you take part in it, or you don't take part in it, it's going to be done. And after everything is done, and then you thought, if I pull away, if I don't do it, then the work will not be done. It's like going into all the world. I'm not going to contribute my part. I'm not going to contribute my effort. But at the end of the day, Demas, you pursued the work, but all nations, they came. Judas, you said, no, I don't want to take part. But see, all nations, they came. Ananas, Sapphira, great family, having resources. You didn't bring everything in, but see the end of the result. At the end of the day, it was done. Barnabas, the Lord chose you, and the Spirit of God said, Separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have appointed them for. And because of a little disagreement, contention, 
John Mark will go. John Mark will not go. Big deal. Leave that alone. And do what God has told you to do. See it now, Barnabas. You didn't write any epistle. You, boy, you boycotted the work when you had not even got to the middle of the way. And now you've abandoned everything. But at the end of the day, Barnabas, the work was still done. You see, when you think about that, that whether I'm there or not, it will be done. Whether I take part or not, it will be done. But the glory and the joy that this work is going to be done and my name is going to be there. And your name is going to be there. You know, it reminds me 1992. We didn't have all these, uh, all this building that was, we didn't have it at that. We were going to have church growth conference. And the time was getting near. And then we collected us. All those uh, buildings you see there, we didn't have them. And everything was bare. We are going to invite people from many countries of the world, thousands of people. And then we said, this is the date. And we need all the money. We need all the builders. We need all the construction workers. We need everybody. Come on, let us do it. I, I know some people that said no. They misinterpreted the purpose and the goal. They misinterpreted the vision. In fact, what he said, somebody said, uh uh, it's not just because of church growth conference, he's building IBTC for his children. I'm telling you. And then the fellow, they confronted me and said, you know, some people are very bold. I pray that God will not give me the wrong kind of boldness. I pray that the boldness God gives will be good and profitable in Jesus' name. Let's come on here. All this weeping of, uh, you know, zeal and everything, we're building, we're building, that I am not going to take part here because I know this is what you are trying to say. My brother, you know my heart, you know the kind of person that I am. How can I build this for my children? I'm telling you that we're going to actual go conference. Say, okay, count me out. But you know, look all around, look at the building. We counted him out, he wasn't part of it, but the building is there today. Look at all those buildings over there on the other side. Some people are not going to take part. And they didn't take part. But look at those buildings there. And look at those other ones where you're coming like this. And you see, and some of you are staying there already. In fact, uh, uh, when I saw it from outside, I said, these people, they won't allow me to go inside. The place is even so good. I want to leave my house and go and sleep there for a night. I said, that place is good. See, it is good. Praise the Lord. The point is, this work will be done. I said, it will be done. But when your part is there, and you remember the block there, you said, I was the one that put it there. The one there, the pole there, I, will, I carried it. And the joy of service, and the joy of being part of the work of God, I pray that that joy, nobody will take it away from you in Jesus' name. Now Jesus said, you go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then all of us will rally around. Barnabas said, I'm not going. I said, don't talk to me. If you don't want to go, I'm going. And then Judas said, I want 30 pieces of silver and that's enough for me. I don't want to be part of it. I said, that's, 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 that's a decision. And then the other one said, Demon said, I don't want to be part of it. I'm going to the world. I said, that's your own business. I want to stay on the world until we finish. You'll find me here. When you come next year, by the grace of God, you'll find me here. Until Jesus comes, until he takes me away, you will be here. I will be here. We'll do it together in Jesus' name. Look at the end result. I'm looking at chapter 7, verse 9. It says, a multitude that nobody can number. It says, of all nations, of all kindreds, of all people, of all tongues. And they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white ribbon, white robes, and palms in their hands. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beast living creatures, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Everybody say, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanks given and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. 
And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence can they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. Yeah, there are trouble. Troubles are always there. Trials are always there. Temptations are always there. Persecutions are always there. But in the midst of those persecutions, the people of God, they kept on preaching. And people, yes, they continue getting saved. We, we keep on going out and the people start coming in, into the kingdom. Whatever stories you reach, whatever news you hear, there's persecution there. There's the something, there's something else happening over there. Oh, it affected that local church everywhere, affected that, that church over there, affected that church over there. Whatever stories you hear, the church is marching on. I said the church is marching on. Stephen died in chapter 7, at the end of chapter 7, chapter 8, the church kept marching on. James died in chapter 12 of Acts, chapter 13, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul. The church kept marching on. And Paul, the apostle, said, I fought a good fight. Now, I'm ready to depart. And thou, Timothy, I hand it over to you. Preach the word in season, out of season. Paul died, the church kept marching on. And Peter said, the Lord has shown me that I was soon put away this earthly tabernacle. But I'm putting you, remembrance, before I go. He went, and the church kept marching on. Whatever news you hear, whatever things you reach, whatever things you kind of, I'm hearing something. Whatever it is, the church is marching on. I said, the church is marching on. Where is the church? I said, where is the church? We are the church. We are marching on. And you are marching on in Jesus' name. That's why it says, look at it in verse 14. I said, I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God. Multitudes, great number. Nobody could number them. They were, be they were before the throne of God. How did that happen? Because they paid the price. Because they planted the churches. Because they evangelized. Because they discipled the converts. Because they made, they gave everything they got that the church will grow. And then it says, therefore, a day before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among the he will be with us. I said he will be with us. Look at verse 16. They shall hunger no more. Give me a good amen. Neither thirst any more. You missed your amen there. Yeah. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Give me a good amen. You know, that's the end result. That's why we're very confident. Whatever may be happening, the Lord has said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and we're going to obey. I say we're going to obey. And at the end of the day, when we tell the story, your converts will be there. Your church members will be there. All the people God has used you to bring into the kingdom and bring unto the Lord, they will be there in Jesus' name. And then they want to count the number now and then they just lost count. They cannot count because it's a great multitude from all our nations and from all the tribes and from all the provinces and from everywhere. And your part will not be missing on that day in Jesus' name. We're talking about the cost of saturation church planting and church growth. Church planting on the one hand, church growth on the other hand, the saturation. That is, you feel every city. You feel every town, and you feel every village with churches, lively churches, New Testament churches, vibrant churches, self-reproducing churches that will fill all the places with, and then, but that has a price. 
It has cause. We cannot just sit at home and have the church planted. We cannot sit at home and have the church grow. That's why it says there's a cost. And there is a price. And, you know, you're not looking for something you want to have a cheaper success or cheaper result. No. Let's look at Second Samuel chapter 24. Second Samuel chapter 24. I'm reading there from verse 24. Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. King said unto him, Nay, before I read that verse 24, uh, can, I, can I go back to verse 22? It says, And Arauna said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be the oxen for the bone sacrifice, and, thresh, and, and threshing instrument, and other instruments of the oxen for wood. Here David needed near to sacrifice to the Lord because of the great plague that devastated the land. And then this other man, Ernest, said, I'll give everything to you. You don't need to pay any price. I'm going to give you the lunch. I'm going to give you the oxen. I'm going to give you the wood for the sacrifice. All these things did Arauna as a king. Give unto the king. He himself was a little king where he was. A local king where he was. And now David, a greater king, came and he recognized his position. So he said, I'll give everything to you and sacrifice to the Lord. And Arana said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. Look at verse 24 now. And the king said unto Arana, Nay, but I will surely buy each of thee at a price. David said, I don't want to offer a chief sacrifice to God that another person will pay for. I don't want to have cheap success that another person will pay for. I don't want to have anything cheap. I say, I want to worship God. I want to sacrifice to God. I want the plagues of the nation to be stopped. I will pay for that. I don't want you to give me free. You know, that's the mind we ought to have. You don't just want your church to grow without putting in your beach without contributing something to it, and without paying the price. It goes on to say, Neither will I offer bond offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing. It says, I don't want that kind of gift, that I want to sacrifice to the Lord, and there's no sweat, and there's no sacrifice, and there's no cost, and there's no price to pay. I want everything. He said, Never. I'm not going to do it like that unless the attitude we ought to have that whatever it will demand that we're to plant churches and we're to make the churches grow we're going to pay the price even if other people are volunteering I will do this, I will do this and by the time you know each they have contributed everything to say no I will still put in my beat I will still sweat, I will still sacrifice I'll still pay the price to make the church to grow I pray that will be your attitude because that's what David said, I'm not going to sacrifice anything to the Lord of that which costs me nothing. That's why we're here, that's why we're being, you know, up and down, because it costs us something. And when you see the result of the price you're paying, I believe that you are going to be happy and joyful in Jesus' name. The cause of saturation church planting and church growth. Point number one, apostolic model of saturation church planting, the apostolic model. The apostles have given us a model of how to plant church and the price they paid and the cost planting such churches. And so, if you want a large church, a big church, a fulfillment or commission, then you know what they have done and you follow after that model. Point number two appointing ministers to shepherd all churches planted, appointing shepherds, appointing pastors, appointing leaders. Appointing teachers that will shepherd, that will feed, that will guide, that will disciple all those churches that have been planted. Appointing ministers to shepherd all churches planted. Number three, appropriate methods for sustained church growth. Appropriate methods for sustained church growth. We're looking at number one. Number one. Apostolic model, the apostolic model for saturation church planting. And let's look at Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. We're looking at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 28. 
apostolic model. How did they do it? Apostolic model. We're looking at uh, chapter uh, chapter five of Acts, verse twenty-eight, saying, "Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name?" And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Look up here, brothers and sisters, that would feel saturation, saturation. Let's say, for example, all the benches you are sitting on now, let's say we have them parched on the other side of the compound or the camp. And we now say, we want to take all those benches from there. I want you to fill all the halls. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're filling all the halls with the benches. And then we choose a leader. And that leader, we call him a foreman. We call him an overseer. We call him a director. We call him a manager. Whatever name we give him. And he's the one directing. But he stands in hall one. And say, bring them, bring them. And he, he feels only her one, although all the benches are taken from that side and they are brought in here, everything is in hall one. Have we filled the auditorium? No. That means then, if we have the church and we're only in one part of the city, take Lagos for example, we started. At Akoka, that's where Unilag is. And then we came through to Shomolu, and then we came through to Bagada area. Let's say the church is only there, but the church is not in every place like Festac, like Lagos Island, like Kiabat, like over here at Limosho, like over there in Agege, like over there in Keja, like over there in Ketu, like all the other places, Moshi and Oshodi and Isolo, all the local governments that you can just go about and you'll never, you'll not see the Palad by Voltobo, when you get to Bagada, the Palad there, the Palad there, the Palad there, have we filled Lagos with the church? No. It is when you look at it, it's going to take planning. And it's going to take some organization before you can feel Jerusalem. What's your doctrine? That is the doctrine there is a post here, there is a building here, there is a location here. And then you strategize everything, and then you map out everything. You say, if we're going to feel Jerusalem with our doctrine, we must feel Jerusalem with worship places and with locations where people can come and hear that doctrine. And then we look at everything and we say, all seven will need this number of benches, all three will need this number of benches, all two. It's not as big as all four, it will need this number of benches, then all three there, all four here, and then we map out everything and evenly, not that we first of all finish all one before we start all two, evenly there's somebody here when you are called to be a manager, a foreman, when you are called to be a director or an overseer, then you choose subordinates under you. You put somebody in hall one, you put somebody in hall two, you put somebody here and here and here and here. That means all in your state, divide everything up. Because you want to fill the stage with your doctrine, your region. You want to fill the region with your doctrine. It is not that it is just where you are, you're feeling all. You, you look at everything and then you say, if we're going to fill it with our doctrine, now to feel, to feel, you have a glass, it's about empty. And then you pour some water in and it reaches middle. Have you filled it up? I said, have you filled it up? Or maybe you have this, you have a bucket here, a pail here, a drum here, and, all, and you line them up like this. And then you're saying, we need water. People here need water to drink. People here need water to drink. People here need water to drink. And then you have maybe a bucket there, a pail here, a container here, whatever. And all the water they are bringing, they just in all three. And pouring everything, pouring everything. And we're saying, over here we need water, we need water. 
just wait, just wait. When we finish this place, the people here are dying of SARS. The people here are dying of over drinking. Think about that. There are some parts of the of the region that they over they are kind of overloaded with churches. The other parts totally dry. To fill Jerusalem or to fill your region or to fill your state with the doctrine, you divide everything. You say, if we have three million in our in our state, and we're going to fill everywhere with the doctrines of Christ, with the doctrine of salvation, of life eternal, and preparing people to go to heaven. Of those three million, the three million are not living in one city. They're not living in one local government. They're living everywhere. You'll divide everything. All right, people here, they need people there, they need. Maybe we need about 300 churches to start with. Or maybe we need about 1,000 churches to start with. Then you come to your church. And then you say, those of us who have been here for about three years who have been born again, can you raise up your hand? They raise up their hands and you check up they are saved. You check up they believe the word of God and they are ready to serve the Lord. You will train them and you will disciple them. And then you will now, after training them, we call that equipping. And then you enlist them, you want to get them involved now. And then you mobilize them, not motivate, not mo motivate. You motivate us, all right, but you mobilize them and you divide them. You will be here, you'll be here, you'll be here, you'll be here, you'll be there. And then when they are all there, search. Now you show them how to evangelize, how to do crusade. How to bring a church there. How to start in a house if they don't have a church building. And then everything is going on all at the same time. Remember, you are overseer. That is, you are a seer over the people. You are not the person to do everything. Overseer means you'll come to hall one. I see going over there. Overseer. you come to hall two. Not that you're preaching all the messages. Not that you are doing all the praying, not that you are doing all the healing, not that you are doing everything there is to be done, not that you are doing all the training, overseer. Then you go to all church, I see God over there, we'll put you here, we'll put you here, and then you make sure that the church is marching on. That is what it means to be an overseer. It means that you are saturating, you are filling up the whole city, you are filling up the whole local government, you are filling up the whole region, and it's going to be done. I said it's going to be done. Not that we are waiting until we finish over here. See, we have not finished evangelizing Lagos. What if we waited since 1973? And we said, somebody wants to go to uh, maybe the southeast. Don't go yet. Look at, look at this place. We're not finished here. Somebody wants to go to south, south. We'll say, don't go yet. Somebody wants to go to Ghana. Wants to go to Sarado. We'll say, no, you can't go yet until we finish over here in Lagos. The gospel will not have come to you, but the way we have done it, that while this one is going on, we're also going there, extending here, extending there, extending there. And then we oversee. We supervise. When we say superintendent or overseer, it's the same thing. That we're overseeing everything that is going on. And then in that way, in a uniform way, the church will be marching on in Jesus' name. You know, if the church was strong in one part of Jerusalem and the church was not even present in the other part of Jerusalem, they would not have said, you have filled up Jerusalem with your doctrine. We're going to do it. Look at chapter 5, verse 42. Chapter 5, verse 42. We're looking at this. It says, and daily in the temple. And in every house. You see that daily in the temple and in every house. That's how to saturate a city. We mark out the houses. I will say, they need the gospel here. They need the gospel here. And, and you know, if you just, let's say, for example, you have a hundred members, a hundred members in the, in the church, and you have a thousand houses in that community, and just say, you whip up their emotion, you, you stir them up, we're going to evangelize, we're going to reach all the people, and their city of one thousand houses, we're going to reach everywhere. And then, without any organization, and without any division of labor, and without appointing this for this and this for that, we we'll release all those hundred people. You know, all those hundred people, they go to one place. There is a particular part that they are used to. They, and they keep on going to that same place every time. And then we say, we're evangelizing, we're reaching people. But here it says, every house. What does that mean? What it means is this. We have a hundred people. 
And here we have all these 1,000 houses, and we must reach every house. Because we're talking about saturation church planting that everywhere must have the presence of the church. We then say, all right, a hundred people were carving out this area. This month, this area, because when you divide 1,000 to 10 places, you have a hundred, a hundred, a hundred in 10 places. It's either you say, all the 100 of us, we're going to reach just this part, part A. And then we reach every house there. Because then we can tell. Because it's just 100 houses and we are 100, we touch everywhere. We reach everywhere. There's a tract there. There's a CD here. There's a DVD there. And there's somebody witnessing there. And then when those people are responding over there, and when we've done that, we say, now next week or next month, we're going to part B of our division of the 1,000 houses. And now we get to all this again. The way we did it in A, we repeat it in B and in C and in D until we we cover all the ten divisions, then we can say that we have reached every house, but then we now have those who have yielded to the Lord in every house over there, those who have yielded to the Lord over there. We look at the churches, then we say, we need, there are many churches, there are about five churches there, we we'll put five there, seven there, eight there, or two there, and all that, and everywhere evenly. Then we raise up pastors. We say, now we need pastors over here, and we're going to teach them on how to shepherd. How to pastor, how to preach, how to develop messages, how to pray, how to counsel. And then we have the normal questions people ask in prayer in the area of marriage, in the area of their job, in the area of their family, in the area of training their children. And we put all those things together and we bring all these prospective pastors together and we train them. After training them, we don't just release them like that to say, you will go and pastor this church, you will go and pastor this church, and pastor this church. That is organized church planting, organized church saturation. And before one year, we are going to reach all those 1,000 houses in that community in Jesus' name. That's what they did. They said, in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking at it now from chapter 8. Let's look at chapter 8, the apostolic model. Apostolic model. We're looking at chapter 8, verse 8. It says, and there was great joy, where? In that city. That means Philip went there to the city of Samaria. And when he went to the city of Samaria, he preached the word unto them. And the whole city, come and hear, come and see. People are getting healed. People are getting delivered. And they were saved. And the, the young man, Philip, did not know how to have them baptized in the Holy Ghost. But no problem, a church is there already. You see, you may not know how to do everything. There's no problem. That's why we have overseers. Then the overseers can come, and the bit you could not do, those overseers will come, and they will do them. But to say, well, I can only pray to the poor to get saved. I cannot pray to them to get healed. Do what you can do your bit. I can preach to them and pray for them to be saved and healed. I cannot lead them to the sanctification experience. Do the bit you can do. I do not, I can lead them to be sanctified, but I do not have the charisma. I do not have the gift to be able to pray for them and you'll have the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Do the bit you can do. When we talk of church planting, church saturation, you will go there, preach Christ unto them. Get them saved. Get them know the Lord. And prepare them for that water baptism. And they become integral members of the church of the living God. Look at verse 14 there. In verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, he sent unto them Peter and John. You see that? What Philip could not do, he's done much. Many people got saved. There was joy in that city. Many people got healed and delivered. But the part he could not do, James and this Peter and John came, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And then it says, for as yet, it was uh, as yet it was falling upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's how far 
they say, Philip could go. Go as far as you can go. Your overseer will come, and if God gives me chance, I will come. And we will add our bid. And when we add our bid, it will complete everything in Jesus' name. Then look at this in verse 17. Then let they their hands on, on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Well, wait before I talk about that. Come back to chapter this chapter eight. We're looking at um, at here from verse nine. Look at verse nine. And there was a certain man called Simon, which before before time in the same city you saw three and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. And then to them, to, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, to saying, and saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard or respect or honor because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when he believed Philip preaching the thing concerning the kingdom of God, the name and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with whom? Tell me out loud. For well, Philip. For well, Philip did not have the gift of the sun mage. No problem. Philip did not know that this man is counterfeit. No problem. Overseers will come. They will settle that. Just because you don't have the gift of discernment, the then I can make mistakes. Of course, I can make mistakes. Here, Philip allowed the Simon to be following him about, almost to be his assistant. Because all the people had respected this Simon. And it was this Simon now that we are told that he was, he believed himself. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. And he wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. It was when the apostles came, when, when Peter and John came and he saw what happened, that he offered them money. And look at it in verse 19, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Tell me. Philip could not say that. Philip did not have, first of all, the discernment to even know that this fellow was not real. And even if he knew, he was, he was not the kind of person like Peter that would say, Thy money perish with thee. What I'm saying is, even though you may not have all the gifts, all the ability, all the courage, whatever you can do, do it. And then our overseers too need to understand that the apostles did not blame Philip. See the people you say you are resting up. See this one now that came and he said, give us, uh, give, uh, I'll give you money and give us, uh, give me this part. See the people are up. They knew that he had gone to the limit, to the limit of his ability and they, had, they rejoiced in that. And the angel that later said, go to the desert, go to the desert and see that Enoch of Ethiopia, did not blame the man. He used everything his God. And the Spirit of God that said, join yourself to this chariot, did not blame the man. He went to the very limit that you could get to. The same thing with you, go to the limit you can get to. And whatever you cannot do, will come and complete it for you in Jesus' name. And so you will see that this is how it was done at that time. We're looking at uh, chapter 9 of Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I'm reading here from verse 31. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then at the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Stop right there. How did those, how did those churches get planted? Because we're told in chapter 8, verse 1, that the apostles remained in Jerusalem. And all the other believers were the people that were scattered everywhere, preaching the word. And so when it says in chapter, in chapter 9, verse 31, then at the churches, in the plural, rest. In fact, how did Ananias, how did he get converted? How did he get, uh, get to the Lord? When you think about, I've heard of what he has done, and he has come to Damascus to also persecute thy saints. How did those saints get there in Damascus? 
when the apostles remained in Jerusalem because all the people that were going about, that were scattered, they went everywhere preaching the word of God. We're not waiting until they become apostles and bishops before they can plant churches. There are some people that are saying, our people are not matured yet. They've been three years in the church, not matured yet. Seven years in the church, not matured yet. Ten years in the church, not matured yet. And they're still not doing anything except maybe to be cleaners in the, in the church or to be this or to be that. We can do more than that. And here you find the church in Galilee and the church in Judea and the church in Samaria and they were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied through the ministry of those that were scattered about. Let's look at chapter 9. In chapter 9, I'm reading now from verse 35. Verse 35, and all that dwelt at Lydda and, and Siron and Siron saw him and turned to the Lord. All that dwelt in that city. All that dwelt in those two cities, they saw the miracle and they turned unto the Lord. A whole city, that means then as we're talking about, saturation church planting. It's just, not just like you have a little church in that corner. You've been there for five years, ten years, fifteen years, and nobody knows about the church. The whole city must hear about the church. Verses 42 and 43. 42 and 43. That's in chapter 9. And it was and it was known. That is the miracle of raising Dockers from the dead. It was not throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon Etana. And so you see how they did it. We're going to do it that way. I said we're going to do it that way. Now, chapter 19 of Acts. Acts chapter 19 verse 10. Acts chapter 19 verse 10, and this continued by the space of two years. This concentration, concentration on the work, a focus on the work. That Paul the Apostle and the team just stayed there until all the people in that province, all the people in that region, all the people in that community until the end. And this continued by the space of two years. So all they, all they that dwelt in Asia, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Your region has been two years. How many people have heard? How many people have known that there's people like Bible Church there? How many crusades have you reached? Do you know how many villages are there? Do your survey. Find out how many villages are there. How many outside your region? Do you know? Do the survey. How many big cities, mega cities are there? Having one million in population? Do they? And find out we are going to give this the word of God. But the church such as them. And we go to it. When you do your survey, you go to plan very well. And when you land, then you raise up people will do the work in Jesus' name. Point number now, appointing ministers to shepherd all churches planting. We've gone different places and we've planted church, I planted church there. And we need to have the ministers or the shepherds or the pastors or teachers and the leaders that will lead in all those churches. And that's what they did. They didn't just plant the church and just leave them there. They'll take care of themselves. No, babies don't take care of themselves. It, the parents will take care of those babies. And if the parents are not going to be available, they put, uh, you know, those who care for those babies, they put those babies in their hands. And that's what we do when we go to plant churches. We plant the church, and if you're an overseer, you are a district pastor, and then you cannot find, and you cannot stay there with them, then you appoint people that you are training. In this day of a telephone, cell, cell, tele, cell phone, that you can easily be calling them, you can be calling them every day, and you can be encouraging that person you put there, you can be asking questions, how is that going? How is this going? I have a challenge. What's the challenge? If I need to come there, I'll come there. It is by that that all the people will put on those places. They'll be able to make the churches grow. Appointing ministers, we're going to appoint them. I said we're going to appoint them. Let's look at Acts chapter 14 verse 23. Acts 14 verse 23. And when they had ordained, appointed them elders in every church. You see that? Every church. All the places they went to plant churches. They didn't just leave them there. How did they find people to appoint? Think about that. Because Paul the Apostle just went out with Barnabas. This time Barnabas was still with Paul the Apostle. And they were still working together. And no other person came from Antioch 
Who are you even trying to give you people from Lagos, from Nigeria, and go to all those various countries? What if we didn't have people to give you? But all the apostles with Barnabas, they went to all those places, and a church planted here, a church planted there, a church planted there. And within the time they went there, they were able, if you look at that verse 23, it says, when they had ordained, that means appointed, when they, are, when they had enlisted these people and put them there, elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they, commit, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Alfred, the Presidia, they came to Pamphylia. You see how they were marching on. Everywhere they planted the church, they put a pastor there. We're still looking for pastors. How is it? We're still looking for pastors. Look up here, brothers and sisters. This is just to help you. I'm not sure. Of course, you understand. When I give you testimonies, it's not because I'm looking for praise or anything. But we need to know this. That uh, there was uh, a time, you know, when one was still young. And I wouldn't have all the pastors here to lead the Bible study. I will lead the Bible study on Monday here in Lagos. And on Tuesday, I might go to a banner every week leading the Bible study. And then there was a time I will go to Benin every Every, every week on Wednesday, and then I'll be leading Bible study there. If I have a particular church, I'll be going there every week and teaching them there. And we have many of the people there at that time. They are now coordinators and group coordinators and leaders in our church in different life. And I used to go to different places every day. Every day. That is on Monday in Lagos, on Tuesday that place, on Wednesday that place. I'll just show you. I do all my lectures at university during the day and then in the evening I'm gone to go and have the Bible. I have a study there. Every weekend, I go to maybe Jebode for, you know, weekend a crusade, a a weekend crusade, and that other place where a crusade. And to Ghana, I go to weekend, I'll just take all my weekend, go to Kumasi a crusade, and come back on Monday for my lectures. And then the following weekend, I've gone to Accra, and then I've gone to all those places. And I still kept my job. I was not on full time. If I could do it at that time, you can do it too. I said you can do it too. And that's how we did it. And that's how the church then prospered. And when we now could find people that could lead the church, then I handed over to them, handed over the Bible Bible study. I handed over the Vijebo day or whatever Bible study. Handed over the beneath something. And then people were not doing it. We can do the same thing. If the fire is within us and the fire has come. I said the fire has come. I, I believe that as the fire has come now, and then the zeal and the passion and the earnestness with which we ought to do it, we're going to do it in the name of the Lord. Ah, did you hear your amen? Now we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. Acts, chapter 15. Let's read there from verse 21. For Moses of old time has in every city them the preaching. See, even the people that were not born again, that is the Jewish people, that is the Pharisees, that is the Sadducees, they had the law of Moses. And they said, everybody in every city must hear about this law of Moses. See what it says in that verse that Moses of old, of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. If the people of the world can do it, why can't we do it? We're going to do it. I said we're going to do it. Look at Acts of the Apostle chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, how we appoint ministers. And then those are ministers that we appoint, we put materials in their hand. We put a literature in their hand. We put the tapes in their hands. And put all this. Sometimes now we even have the iPod or iPad. And they contain many messages. You can put the messages there. And they can be listening. And they can develop themselves. The Kindle is there. They can read all those things there. They can even read it out for them. And uh, if you suppose that she's the laptop, you can put in the text aloud there. That's all the good, good materials. The text aloud would help you read everything out. And you can literally have a Bible school inside that laptop. You can have a Bible school inside that little telephone. That's all the, all the messages, uh, you know, of, uh, of the church and the, the area of uh, child of uh, child training, the area of uh, youth work, and the area of campus work, and the area of the women's work. All the messages 
Jesus at work in all those areas. They, you can put everything on the iPhone, and every day you are training yourself. You have a timetable because we we'll just put you as a pastor there. How do I deal with the women? How do I deal with the young people? How do I deal with this section? How do I pray for the sick? All the messages of the faith clinics that we have at the retreats, at the conference, and women conference, and campus conference, everything that we have done, you can put everything on that iPad, on that iPhone, and you are listening every time, and faith coming by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and then you become a giant, you are already in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 16, I'm reading verses 4 and 5, and as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for the keep which were ordained of the apostles and the elders which were Jerusalem. The elders remained in Jerusalem, but they put the materials in their hands, the decrees, the principles, the doctrines, the word in their hand. And they went from city to city, and they went to all the cities. You see there in verse 4, and then they delivered unto them. We can have a library in every local church, a library of our DVD, a library of our CD, a library of all the messages, that, a library of our literature, all the books that were published, all the magazines were published and somebody is looking for material we're going to prepare for retreat and he wants material on this material it just comes to the church library every local church can raise up a library we can say we're going to devote this amount of money to raise up a library that is the library of our books in particular and of course of other books like concordance like real bible with this and that all the bible helps everything can be there and then in every local church we are well equipped and then it says in verse 5 so what they were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. That's how they did it. Because they had all those ministers appointed and they worked and they worked hard. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. Titus, Titus, Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, let us see what uh, the Apostle Paul was uh, talking, was uh, saying to Titus. In Titus chapter 1, we're looking at verse 5. Titus chapter 1, we're looking at verse 5. It says, for this cause let I be increased. Paul the Apostle said, uh, Titus, do you know why I let you increase? Yes, sir, I know. Tell me. It is to preach every message? No, you got it wrong. It is to organize crusade? No, you got it wrong. It is to make sure that anybody that needs counseling, every one of them will be coming to me. No, you got it wrong. Create at a lot of cities, a lot of islands, many, many islands. And Paul the Apostle said, Titus, this is your territory. This is your region. This is the place where you'll be an overseer. Look at what was to do in chapter 1 verse 5. For this cause I let thee increase that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain and ordain elders where in every city, as I had appointed thee, he said, already I appointed you. You know the questions I asked you. You know the experiences I was looking for. I wanted to know whether you are saved or not. Ask them, are they saved? I wanted to know whether you are sanctified, whether you believe in holiness or not. And you gave me the answer, ask them, are they sanctified and holy? I asked you, have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? The questions I asked you, when I appointed you, the magic in you ask them, you know what it is? that not everybody in Crete will come over to Corinth for purposes to them. Point, he said, I have said you now, in all the cities in Crete, in all, this, all those islands you are there, that of pastors, you interview them, and then you develop them, and you appoint elders, appoint pastors in every city of that Crete, as I have appointed you. That's how to do it. That's how they did it. If we are going to do that today, we are going to succeed in Jesus' name. But you know, brother, when everything has to wait for a state of seer, until the state of seer comes, we cannot plant church here. We're just in this local church over here. And the people over here, they're waiting for us. Over there, they're waiting for us. Over there, they're waiting for us. And then when we even go to do crusade, we don't have the liberty. We don't have the freedom to appoint a pastor. We say, it's a state overseer that will come and appoint a pastor over there. And then we're waiting for them at the headquarters of our state, at the capital of our state. When they have enough members, they never have enough workers. 
at the headquarters. They never have enough coordinators at the headquarters. They never have enough money at the headquarters. If we're waiting for them to come to the, from the capital and give us pastors and give us leaders and give us money and give us this, we'll never do anything. And Paul said, Titus, don't wait for me. I've appointed you. It is now your turn to appoint all the other people in every city. No city must be led without a church and without a pastor. If we do it like they did it in the, in the New Testament, we're going to have the same result they had. We're going to have it in Jesus' name. Point number three now, appropriate methods for sustained church growth. Appropriate methods for sustained church growth. It's very simple. Appropriate methods. I'm looking at. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles. I'm looking at chapter two, Acts chapter two, and I'm reading from verse forty-two. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Now they continue steadfastly. How can I do that? Because uh, let me do. Let me do some calculation with you. Let's say, for example, they were teaching one hour every day. In uh, seven days, there will be seven hours of teaching. In four weeks, in 52 weeks, let's say 50 weeks, if you have seven hours in a day, in 50 weeks, you are going to have 350 hours. Is that all right? Okay. You have 350 hours. And then the two, because there are 52 weeks in the, way, in, the, in the year, the two times seven, that's 14. 14 plus 350, that is 364. Now, if you think about it, that I have an assignment, and my assignment for this year is going to be that I must prepare a message, I must teach 364 lessons, and I must spend 364 hours. It will look so big, it will make you afraid. Don't think about the next day, just today. That's what Jesus said. He said, the evils of the day, they're sufficient for the day. That means the responsibilities of the day, they're sufficient. Just one day at a time. All I have to do today is to teach one hour. That's enough. And once I, I prepare for that one hour, I teach that one hour, I don't think about tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, tomorrow will think of itself. Then tomorrow you say, now I have one hour to teach today. And then another day comes, I have one hour to teach today. By the end of the year, you will have taught for 364 hours without even knowing that you have done anything. Because you are taking one day at a time. And they continue steadfastly. That's how they did it. They didn't think about, huh, this work is very great and this work is is very heavy and we're going to do all this and then to teach all the doctrines one two three four five until the very end and these are going to be established and strong and stable don't think about that what are you to teach today concentrate on what are to teach the people today it's as we do that the church will be strong and the church will grow and the church will be established in jesus name i'm looking at matthew chapter 26 verse 25 Matthew chapter 26, verse 55. This is how Jesus did it. Matthew chapter 26, verse 55. In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, and ye come out as against the thief with swords and staves, for to take, for to take me, I search daily with you teaching. I sat daily with you teaching. That's how the church was strong. That's why those apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were well armed. They were well taught. They were established on the truth. Because Jesus sat daily teaching them in the temple. And then he says, and ye laid no hands on me. If that is the way he did it, why can't I do it like that? Why can't you say, I'm going to commit myself to growing the church, establishing the church, and making the church very strong and solid. In Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, we're looking at verse 47. Luke chapter 19, verse 47. And he taught daily in the temple. And he taught daily in the temple. Why? Because that was the main thing that he was, he was called to do. And when you realize that this is the main thing you are called to do, you will do it every day. Uh, you spend time to prepare breakfast every day for your family. 
That takes time. And to prepare lunch for a family. And to prepare supper for a family. Put all the time together. The time that you spend in preparing breakfast and lunch and supper. It will be more than one hour all together. And you do that every blessed day of the, of the year. And it is just to feed the body. How about feeding the soul? How about helping people to get ready for heaven? It's one hour too much to contribute to the lives of the people that the Lord is using us to take to heaven. Not too much at all. And that is how we develop the church. How we strengthen the church. How we impart everything with God onto the church. The churches that are planted. We can do it. We are going to do it in Jesus' name. Even without uh, you preparing food uh, for other people, even the time it takes to eat, don't you know it takes time? If somebody says, I don't have time, I don't have time, then one, one, uh, uh, a pastor from uh, Ikichi was preaching to us, or maybe another person that said, he said, no breakfast, uh, no, no Bible, no breakfast, and no... Ah, you have forgotten. No scripture, no supper. Now, if that is so, it takes time to take breakfast. Let's say you, are, you take at least 20 minutes in taking your breakfast, at least another 20 minutes in taking lunch, at least another 20 minutes in taking supper. Already you have one hour. And if we have one hour to do this to feed the body, why don't we have one hour to feed these people that will never die? The people never die in souls. That's what I mean. That is, once somebody is born into this world, is going to live forever and ever, whether in heaven or in hell. Because of that, we're committing ourselves after all out of 24 hours of the day we can't find one solitary hour two hours to teach the people we're preparing to get to heaven of course we can well to find them chapter 19 chapter 19 verse 47 you see what is said what is said over there it says and it taught daily in the temple we can do it we're going to do it i said we're going to do it and that's why we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're looking at verses 1 and 2. Appropriate methods of sustained church growth. That is, we're talking of church growth spiritually. Church growth uh, mentally. Church growth in, in number as well. Church growth in saturation. Church planting. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. By now you are strong. I said, by now you are strong. All these messages you have heard and you know, everything inside you firing you up and making you father into the Lord. I'm sure you are strong by now. And then in verse 3 it says, and the things which thou hast heard, have you heard anything since you came? I said, have you had anything since you came? It says, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Look up here for a moment. Now when I say look up, it means I want you to really look up. You say, you know, the pastor always says, of course, I always say that. I say it for a purpose. I'm saying number one, the first generation I have Paul. Second generation, I have Timothy. Third generation, I have faithful men. Then I have the others also. Paul, Timothy, faithful men, then others also. How many generations there? That three, four generations within a short period of time. This is what I mean. Here we are now. The things you are the Timothy. I said, you are the Timothy. I said, you are the Timothy. The things that you have heard, all this is in your notes. Look for somebody in the church that you came from. Walker, member, somebody who is born again. Look for somebody. You are the Timothy. Let's say, for example, just to round it up in a figure, we have about 15,000. We're more than that, but let's just say 15,000. When you think about VLC, about 10,000. Let's say now 25,000. And each one is Timothy. Each one is Timothy. Everything you have got here, buy the tapes. Buy the tapes. Don't say you don't have money. You have money to buy newspaper, buy the tapes. You have money to buy bread, buy the tapes. You have money to buy, you even buy more than bread. I see that some of you, when you are talking to me, I hear that it's a, a granite is smelling from your mouth. You have money to buy granules, buy the tips. You have money to buy coke. Those of you, that brother here. 
He takes coke. Don't you take coke? I know you. You have money to buy coke. Buy the taste. By the time you put all the money you spend on paper, on bread, on sugar, on honey, on this one, on tea, on coffee, on Nesquik, every you put everything together, that money is already more than buying the taste. When you buy the taste, then you listen and find a faithful person and you look you locate him. Twenty five thousand people they are looking for you are a Timothy. I'm looking for faithful man, faithful woman, sister, get a sister, brother, get a brother. And then 25,000, each one getting another person. How many are we going to get? 25,000. And then for one whole month, or for three months, or for six months, you drill that person. Have an appointment with that person. Four o'clock, or five o'clock, or six o'clock, I'm going to come to you. I have something to share. He's a believer already. He's a member of the church already. And you drill him. And you teach him. He's a faithful person to you. And you get him through everything you have got him through. And the conviction you have, you pass onto him. The knowledge you have, you pass onto him. The desire that I'm going to plant a church, I'm going to do something for God, you pass it to him. And now you have the church. When you are going for evangelism, go with him. And you are training him. And now he too, because there's Paul. There's Timothy, and then there's the faithful men, and then the other souls shall be able to teach others also. Let all those uh, 25,000 people, let them find their own 25,000 people too. And then the process you have gone through, let them go through that. And while you finish with the first search, choose another 25,000, one, 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 and you concentrate on them. Before long, we will even raise up up to 500,000 churches. Where are you? I said, where are you? Where did you keep your voice? Amen. You know, I have confidence that everything God has sent me to pass on to you, you are a faithful Timothy. It will be done. And then the next generation, they will do it. And the others, they will do it. Well, this year now we had this uh, Congress uh, here and there. What is going to happen if you do, and I'm sure you are going to do it. I said I'm sure you are going to do it. We might have to say the first batch of the Congress, it is this week. The second batch of Congress, it is this week. After all, if you get your 25,000 and then the others get their 25,000 and we train them and school them and fire them up next year, it may not be only one week. It may be this week and this week and that week. You say, who will teach them? You wait and see. You will do it. I said you will do it. If you are ready, why don't you stand up and say, Lord, the time has come. We're going to do it. We're going to plant the churches and we're going to strategize. We're going to manage everything very well. We're going to do the work of the Lord. This work will prosper in your hand. You are a success already and we're going to succeed together in this great work of saturation, church planting and church growth. We will do it in Jesus' name. Raise your voice to and say, Lord, I am ready. Lord, it will be done. Lord, it will be done. Lord, it will be done. Don't be tired. Don't be tired. Don't be tired. If your father in the Lord is not tired, you must not be tired. You have the same strength. You have the same vision now. You have the same dream now. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, we will do it. I will do it. I make myself available. I'll pay the price. I'll pay the price. I will pay the price. I will search yourself to organize us to get it done. Our region overseers organize us. That's what we have to do. Make us do our duty. Make us carry our responsibility. Don't just do everything for us. Teach us. Train us. Equip us, mobilize us, and then distribute us everywhere where we need to plant churches and where we need to grow those churches and raise up those leaders. Don't belittle your own strengths, don't belittle your possibilities. You can do it, you will do it. 
Commit yourself to the Lord. It will take some strength and sacrifice. It's going to cost you some time and sacrifice. Might even cost you some money as a sacrifice. Everything you give, the Lord will multiply and reward you. Those who are forsaking houses, land, and other things, the Lord said that in this life, you will gain a hundredfold. And in the world to come, life eternal. The Lord is no debtor to anyone. Whatever you give, He multiplies and gives you back. Spend and the spend. Be willing to do it. He'll give you the strength, give you the courage. He will. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength. When you see souls coming to the kingdom through you, when you see churches being planted through you, when you see lively churches being restored through you, and don't give all this only to the men. My dear sister, you have something to do. You can Priscilla and Aquila, husband and wife, they trained up Apollos. That one became mighty in the scriptures. I want you to check up Aquila and Priscilla. Their names are mentioned six times in the New Testament. Three times Aquila and Priscilla, three other times Priscilla and Aquila. Three times, husband and wife. Three other times, wife and husband. Clear all the walls of demarcation between you and your wife. The two of you should be one. And serve. Raise up people. Raise up churches. Raise up leaders. Train them. For the sake of the progress of the work, the United. And then with members of the church, for the sake of progress. What I must understand you know, our leaders add with members of the church, let's just forgive and forget and move on. While we're arguing on non-essentials and, you know, I disagree with this, I agree with this, souls are dying. For the sake of the souls that need to be saved through you and through me, let's brush aside all those things that divide us. The Lord has given me the word, like your Paul of today, and you are the Timothy. I passed it on to you. Now you find faithful men and women. You might be able to even to take ten at the same time. You might be able to take two at the same time or five at the same time. Faithful men and women who can teach others also. Fight them. Pour your life into them. Train them. Equip them. Send them forth. And then supervise. The Lord will reward you.